For you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption as sons by whom we cry, Abba, Father. Please pray with me. May the words of my mouth and meditations of all of our hearts always be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. So you seated. Please be seated. It's not a good way to begin. We're already slurring words, and I haven't even completed one <laughs> sentence yet. It's, uh. Anyway, if you would please open the Bible to Romans 8, it would seem, without my really intending to do so, that I found myself sucked into an accidental <clears throat> four-week sermon series on Romans 8, beginning last week, oddly enough, and I didn't even know it then, uh, because we looked at the beginning of Romans 8 last week, how we are in this life, uh, on this side of things, as it were, inevitably trapped within a, a matrix of sin, but that we don't look to our that failure, or even look to ourselves to know who we are, to understand who we are and all that, we look to Christ. We look to his cross. Uh, his cross is that place where God has forever removed all the consequences for all our failure, which means our true identities are no longer found in that failure, or even in trying to avoid that failure, or even trying to hide that failure from everybody else noticing. But rather, our true identities are found in Christ, in the cross, in the love of God for us seen on that cross, not only in that failure, but rather precisely because of that failure. In other words, we are who we are, not in what we do or don't do, but in what God has done for us in Jesus Christ, which sounds like good news, right? And that new identity in Christ logic there continues seamlessly into this week's reading in Romans. All this stuff about adoption, about being sons and daughters, and therefore heirs, which also sounds like pretty good news. So then, after looking at that, I just kept kind of skimming ahead to next week's reading and the language about all creation groaning towards that adoption, birthing that adoption, if you will. And then the week after that, we get all this predestination language from Paul. And I mean, I love me some predestination language. <laughs> God working out all things for our good and for his glory, usually completely and utterly in spite of us and all because of who he is, despite who we are. That sounds like some good news too. Anyway, it struck me that there's an arc here in Romans 8 in this movement. One from our firsthand experience of what seems to be reality, namely our experience of reality as sinners, Two, to the true nature of our reality, now in Christ, now with saints, a reality we need to be told about, usually again and again. Three, to the bigger, grander picture of the movement and the purposes of the whole creation towards bringing that new and true reality of our sainthood into being, into fruition. And then four, all of it grounded in the even deeper before all things, even before any of us, purpose and intentions of God for that good reality, for that good reality for us. In other words, Romans 8 is a picture from beginning to end, from alpha to omega, if you will, of God's choosing us, of God's choosing to be for us. And so what I want to do over the next three weeks with Romans 8 is to talk about that choosing, that choice of God over and above anything we might choose on our own, that choice working itself out from God's will throughout all creation and into our lives, but in reverse, right? And so this week, I want us to look at that choice of God for us in the outworking of our lives. Next week, we'll look at that choice of God for us in the outworking of creation, or more specifically, in the suffering of all history that brings that choice of God into being. And finally, the week after that, that good choice of God understood fundamentally as inseparable from the good character of God. God's choice for us or for anything is just who he is. But I preview all that now up front, so that as we dig in once again into this war, if you remember from last week, as Paul called it in Romans 7, this war between the sinner and Satan within us, I preview all that so we can understand the bigger and deeper foundations of the hope we have in this choice of God for us 
not only in this moment, in the now, as it were, but from the beginning, from beyond the beginning. So let's dig into our little chunk of Romans 8 this morning. Take a look at verse 15 again, with which I began. For you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption as sons by whom we cry, Abba, Father. Now, I frankly always feel rather useless when I preach from Paul because it's just kind of like, well, <laughs> there it is, right? <laughs> Whatever Paul just said, all right, let's close in prayer, right? Um, <laughs> And I mean, there's a part of me that thinks we'd probably get to the coffee and the cookies. I see sugar cookies out there a little faster if I did that. But you guys all pay me the big bucks. So I guess I guess I got to earn my keep. So what is Paul actually doing here, at least in the second half of this verse? Well, he's basically articulating the fact of the gospel, the gospel reality in which anyone who is in Christ stands If you look at the language in the preceding verses, go up to the beginning of the reading, verses 7 and following, and skipping all the bad, nasty stuff about flesh for now, but just focusing on language like having the Spirit of God or the Spirit of Christ in you. If that is you, if you are indwelt by the Spirit of God, by the Spirit of Christ, there is a new gospel reality that stands over you, a new gospel reality that defines you. According to verse 15, you have received, you have been given, that is, you didn't earn it, the spirit of adoption, right? As sons and implicitly daughters. And we can tease out some further details from that. First, to be adopted, that means you weren't born into a given family. That is, you didn't come into God's family by nature, by genetics, as it were. That's what distinguishes you from Jesus, among other things. So don't get too cocky with this, I'm a child of God stuff, right? Come on, keep it real, guys. Whereas Jesus is a son of God by nature, you and I are sons and daughters of God by adoption. It's like if your kid ever found a stray, mangy, stinky dog with one good eye in a dumpster near your house, and he brought him home to be a part of your family, that's a pretty good image of us. We're hoodlums, we're vagrants, we're bums on the street that Jesus found and brought back to his father to be a part of his family. Can I get an amen? Amen. And that's why when you come to the table for communion, it's not about coming up here with some kind of holier than thou attitude, this pious sort of, oh, I have to clean up my life before I can get up here, your life fully in order, sin free. You are a beggar fresh off the streets of sin, and you come with outstretched hands deserving of absolutely nothing. But the Son found you, and the Father loves you, and so he feeds you, not with scraps or leftovers, but with the flesh and blood of his own dear, by nature, Son. And not just to show you that you are, but to make it so that you are a full beloved member of his family. And this brings us to the second thing. To be adopted means that once you're in, you're in. Once you're adopted, you are a full-fledged part of the family. You do not live under the stairs like Harry Potter, right? (laughs) You have a place at the table and a room of your own even, as it were. What does Paul say in verse 17? He says that if we are children, then we are heirs, heirs of God, and fellow heirs with Christ. Father and Son, who brought you into this family, now declare that they are sharing the entirety of the kingdom with you, which seems very much against every ounce of estate planning logic I've ever known. (laughs) If you've ever been the heir to an estate, or heaven forbid, the executor of one, you got to be wondering at this point, What the heck is Christ thinking to make all us mangy mutts the eternal co-heirs of his eternal estate? Sounds like a probate court nightmare. (laughs) Surely, even just being named tenant farming serfs would have been better than what the lot of us street rabble could even ask for, let alone expect. And yet in the goodness of God, in the character of God, which is where we're going to end at the end of all this stuff in a couple weeks on Romans 8, We are not made tenants, we are not made serfs, but landlords with him. We are no longer slaves, 
but heirs. And as it turns out, as the song goes, his father's house is a big, big house. But I'm not going to sing that song this morning. Been there, done that. (laughs) But that, right? Some kind of slice of the kingdom, some kind of room in the Lord's mansion, a plot of land in the heavenly estates, those things in themselves are not even the real inheritance that Paul has in view. Those things are not the true wonder of what it is that Christ has made it possible for us to share in. And that's because, and this is the third thing, the chief inheritance of being an adopted child of God, the chief inheritance that Paul is underscoring in our reading is the right, and even more than that, the ability to do something that is on the surface so seemingly simple. The end of verse 15 again, you have received the spirit of adoption as sons by whom we cry, Abba, Father. There it is, right there. You have the ability to cry, Abba, Father, to call out to God as your father. It's just like that moment in The Empire Strikes Back when Luke finds out who his real father is, but also probably very different, right? Now, this is a radical idea, unless you're a Roman emperor, right? In which case, you're probably a little crazy already, and the fact that you think you're the son of a god somewhere is probably the least of your delusions. (laughs) And nobody's going to argue with you anyway, because you're like, you know, a Roman emperor and all. But for those of us who aren't Roman emperors, this is radical. This is crazy. It was radical for Jesus in his ministry, the fact that he called God his father, but it was even more radical for him to teach his disciples to pray that way, to pray to God by addressing him as our father. In fact, when we pray that prayer in a little bit, I will introduce it by saying, and as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to pray. That is true. It is bold to pray that way. It is a bold, stinking prayer with a bold, stinking claim. And yet it is a claim that is no less true for all its boldness, because that claim is our reality. The reality that now, because of the one who is the Father's Son by nature, and because the one that one brought us home to his Father through his cross, the reality now is that we get to call, that we are able to call his Father our Father. But more than that, look at the specific language, the specific phrasing that Paul employs Namely, that it is by the spirit of adoption as sons that we cry out, Abba, Father. We're not given a separate kind of superpower in ourselves here. We don't level up and have some kind of internal ability now. We are given the spirit. We are given a person. And for what it's worth, the early church fathers, they all kind of went nuts with this passage because they saw here some rich fodder for understanding better who exactly the Spirit is, and what exactly he does. Look at verse 6 before our reading. He's mentioned as the Spirit of life and peace. In verse (coughs) 9, being in the Spirit is set in opposition to being in the flesh, and we'll get to that in a second. And he is also the Spirit of God, but in language that overlaps with the fact that he is also the Spirit of Christ, right? They blur. Who is also the Spirit of life, verse 10. The same Spirit who, verse 11, raise Jesus from the dead. And thus the same spirit who, verse 12, seems somehow to be able to put us to death and to raise us to life. The same spirit who indwells us, verse 14, into our being adopted sons of God. And the same spirit who bears witness, verse 16, to that truth, to that truth about us, but also to that truth to us that truth that we are indeed sons and daughters of God, because that is not an intuitive thought. In other words, to put it all together, our crying Abba Father, our calling Christ's Father, our Father, is one part, albeit the end result in Paul's logic, it's one part of this huge work that the Spirit is doing in us. It's not a little holy power we get when we finally screw our heads on right and believe in God, It is a radically transformative miracle wrought by God's now being within us in some way. Take a moment. Well, take a moment in a little bit when we pray the Lord's Prayer together right before communion. 
right? And, and when we say those seemingly simple words with which the whole prayer begins, when we say those words, our Father, take a moment to understand what you are witnessing in this place, in yourself, but in everybody around you. You are witnessing a miracle, and not just any old miracle, but a miracle in the order of Lazarus walking out of the tomb. Because understand that Paul is talking about this spirit who is the spirit of God, who is even further the spirit of God who raised Jesus from the dead on that Easter Sunday morning, and who is even further, and this is Paul's key point, the spirit of God who is raising you from the dead. Because like Jesus, who is the son of God by nature, an adopted son of God, an adopted daughter of God, is also necessarily a resurrected child of God. In essence, that's kind of the nature of the whole adoption process here that Paul's describing. You die, right? Once at one point, but also day by day, in and through that, holy, that spirit of God at work in you. And then again and again, you get raised to new life, a new identity, a new reality in that spirit of God, such that it is no longer that dead in you that truly lives, that truly is at work in you, but the spirit of God who now makes alive. The spirit of God who cries out with your vocal cords, but in his spirit, Abba, Father. And if that is true, and I think it is, then a fourth point is also true, that this adoption is all by grace. It's all the gift of God. You are the passive recipient of something that is all God's doing. And there's a simple logical truism behind this, an obvious, utterly obvious reason. Namely, that dead men don't raise themselves. Dead women, too. Indeed, if dead people have one special superpower, it is precisely in the ability to remain dead. Decomposing, too. I guess they're pretty good at that. Also smelling bad after a time, but we digress. In any event, corpses tend not to get up to go grab a bite to eat at Subway, let alone cry out, Abba, Father. And the truth is, if you're living out of the spirit of flesh, then, as Paul says in verse 10, you're ultimately already dead because of sin. You're a, you're a dead man walking. You're a zombie, lifeless, dead, but still walking around for some reason pretending to be alive. And thus, in this state, dead in our sin, we can do things but things that chiefly just serve to make us more dead, physically, intellectually, spiritually, morally. But anything truly new, anything on the order of resurrection, new life from that place of death, that's going to be a God thing. That's a spirit of God thing. And the whole point of any evidence in your life that you might not be just another zombie reeking of sin and death, the whole point of any such evidence from the fact that you can indeed say our Father with some degree of gratitude, with some degree of hope, with some degree even of maybe need or desperation in that moment. To the fact that, I don't know, what's on the other end of the range of that? Maybe you're levitating during prayer time this morning. I don't know, right? Whatever it might be, whatever it might be where you think maybe you can see God doing something in your life, raising you from the cold, dead grave of your heart in some way. The whole point of such evidence, however small or however big, is to serve as verse 16 says as a witness from God's spirit, capital S, to your spirit, little s. It's a witness to your spirit from the spirit of God that despite everything you see in the mirror or in the wrecks of your life or in the disasters of your relationships, there is a deeper reality, a God-driven reality of what Paul is describing here that you are indeed, verse 16, a child of God, an heir of God, his beloved, and he has come for you and is still coming for you always. Even if you're struggling with it all, even if you don't quite see, but man, you wish you could, that, even just the desire for that is a witness from the Spirit of God. Because corpses don't struggle even like that. Corpses don't fight like that. Corpses can't even want to be alive again. And that is the definition of grace, a power a strength, right? The spirit as a gift who comes from completely outside you to work a miracle within you. And that witnesses 
And that witness should do two things to you. One, it should make you really grateful. It should definitely, it shouldn't definitely, it should definitely not puff you up because it ain't about you. Rather, it should drive you to your knees in gratitude and thanksgiving to God. It should produce that same sentiment at the heart of Paul's epiphany in Romans 7. Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Sorry. The second thing it should do, and this is more to the point that Paul is getting at in our passage, the second thing it should do is make you wonder. Make you wonder why the heck you are continuing to rely on, continuing to focus on what Paul identifies as things of the flesh. Look at how our reading opens. In effect, it's the -the the on-the-ground problem that Paul sees in the lives of Christians, given what should be the greater defining reality of adoption, the defining reality of being children of God. Look at verse 7 and following. For the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God, for it does not submit to God's law. Indeed, it cannot. Those who are in the flesh cannot please God. Now, this idea of flesh, in Greek the word is sarkos, which you might recognize from the English word sarcophagus, right? Which is the 50-cent fancy cocktail party word for coffin, which literally translates to flesh-consuming things, sarcos, flesh, phagus, eating, which is really rather gross. And I probably didn't need to mention it, but I did, so too bad. (laughs) Anyway, that Greek word sarkos has a wide range of meaning. It can mean flesh, but it refers more broadly to the body and everything conceptually kind of related to it, in orbit around it. And so it can mean the flesh is what covers the exterior of the body, that is the the visible presentation of the body. It can also just mean a person, right? Someone who has a body, in the same way that we use words like some body and every body, right? We still have that word body in there. It can also refer to the physical connections of a person through their body, that is to say one's ancestral genealogy, as opposed to, say, your intellectual development and all the philosophical um, antecedents that have informed you, or whatever the case may be, right? In short, the wider range of the meaning of sarcos, what the ESV translates as flesh here, encompasses a broader sense of people and their earthly things. The whole range of creaturely being, of creaturely comforts, as it were, including, but not necessarily limited to, such carnal desires, Right? Carnal desires such as the fact that your, your motto in tough times is stay calm and eat cookies, right? Or whatever particular carnal thing is your jam, right? But also more broadly, including and encompassing things like the sense of self-worth you derive, that you crave and you pursue from all the various value systems and reward systems out there in the world, whether in terms of your wallet or in terms of your ego, or your security, or your prestige, or your reputation, whatever it is. In other words, all the ways in which you might focus, in which you might set your mind, as Paul puts it, on making yourself feel good, or at least a little better, through things that are out there in the world, through the meanings and values that can be found out there. And it's not that all such things are inherently bad. It's not that there isn't good stuff out there. The danger, though, is in turning to any of that to define you to give you hope. And Paul's point here is obvious enough from verses 7 and 8. None of that's going to please God. In fact, those things embraced like that, embraced in that way, they can't please God. And thus, you can't please God in those, in those kinds of moments. Indeed, when you are aimed at finding other avenues to happiness, finding other avenues to comfort or hope or redemption, apart from God or even alongside God, such pursuits actually become hostile to God. Because to set your mind on such things as a kind of highest good, as a kind of highest need, is necessarily to set your mind against God, right? To push God aside, to push God away. And the scary thing is, these things can even include the things you do in what would seem to be your Christian walk. When your mind is approaching even these things with that same kind of fleshly, worldly logic where you're securing for yourself by what your own doing some kind of good for yourself, right? You're turning to them as that other thing out there. Your prayer life, when it's done because you should, because you think you should, right? Or because you want to be seen in some way as holy or at least not completely bankrupt as a Christian. You're serving or you're giving when it's done. Not even so much so others will know, although that sometimes happens, I hear. 
but more so that you can feel better about yourself. Even desperately wondering what is and what is not under these different categories, if you're falling into the same traps again, even that gets tricky because even then, you're still trying to put your trust in something other than God, away from God and God alone. But the whole point that Paul is trying to make in our passage, and I want us to see this clearly and then wrap up, the whole point that Paul is trying to make in our reading by, on the one hand, identifying this problem of experience in verses 7 to 8, that universal perennial problem of the Christian life, namely the ease with which we slip back into the flesh, into the old ways of trying to earn our standing or worrying about our standing. And on the other hand, spelling out in such details in the rest of the passage, verses 10 to 17, the reality of the spirit of our adoption as children of God. The whole point that Paul is trying to make can be seen in verse 9, in that big however moment. All right, look at verse 9. You, however, are not in the flesh, but in the spirit. The you that wants so badly to be respected and appreciated at work, that's not really you. The you that wants so badly not to be judged so harshly for the way things turned out or didn't. That's not the real you. The you that is sure that you cannot make it through the night without this or that thing that you are sure you desperately need. That is not the real you. Rather, you are one in whom the Spirit dwells, the same Spirit who raised Jesus from the dead. You are, Paul is saying, no longer a slave to those things you crave, but an heir to all the things you truly need in Christ through the Spirit. And if you need help, if you need assurance in the mess of it all, you simply need to cry out in that need, in your desperation, to the one whose child you are. You simply cry out, Abba, Father, and know And know that it is not you speaking in that instance so much as it is the Spirit speaking through you. God speaking to God in and through your person such that even in the hurt, even in the need, even in the worst, you may know that God has you that and is that so with you. And so hear those final words of our reading one last time. Verse 16 and following, the Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God, and if children, then heirs, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, provided, or actually, it's just since, since we suffer with him, in order that we may also be glorified with him. These human lives, whether we are Christians or not, are not easy, but the Christian, the one In Christ, who is a child of his Father and filled with his Spirit, is never alone in the suffering, but rather is quite literally in and through Jesus Christ caught up into the life and the love of the entire Trinity, especially in and through the suffering, now cross-shaped because of Christ, and ultimately, therefore, towards a promised chair in his glory. And so to him be all the glory forever and ever. Amen.